And that someone has half in the account? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got the whole but... You got the whole yes. Interesting. We, there's someone else in the audience just like you. You know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and who's familiar with the concept? Everyone else is familiar with it. Okay, wonderful. So I'd like to introduce our uh, panel now. Um, first of all, we have Chris Monford who works at Atlassian. Um, he calls himself a previous Bitcoin skeptic and now uh, a supporter and, and maybe even an evangelist. Um, and so I'm really interested to hear his experience of getting into the concept of Bitcoin and hopefully he can share a little bit more about that. Um, then we've got Pentelis, yep. yes, excellent, um, who is the previous vice president of the Bitcoin Association. Um, it wasn't that he got kicked out last weekend, it's that he has a business interest that are moving him away from the association. <laughs> so also good there, but has plenty of other things on his plate. Um, and lastly, we've got another Chris, Chris G, Chris Gazowski, um, who looks after the Bitcoin ATMs in Australia. So, before we get into that, I'd love to have you uh, just turn to the, the people you're with and, and share what you're hoping to get out of this session or what brought you here. So, just quickly turn to the other person, introduce yourself. And, um, you're looking particularly inspired. Yes, yes. Um, what, what brought you guys here tonight? That's fine. Me and my account, Jason, my name's Tony. Yep. We uh, are looking for investments. Okay. Now I can talk loud enough. <laughs> uh, that's it. Jason was just something. Great. How about down here? What, what, what brought you guys along tonight? Ah, uh, hi. How are you doing, Thank you. Uh, my name is White Chul. Uh, I'm a child accountant, and, uh, but I have a uh, couple of startups of my own. Uh, my interest in this is more about the digital space and how this is transforming you know, everything that we could possibly have in the future. Um, how people will transact with this currency and, and, and what that means for how we do business. And it really is a
grew up in the 80s, you know, the Commodore 64 and these old toy, really very small and unimportant looking computers. Uh, and I remember when there were such people as computer experts um, and the concept of that. <laughs> Community was actually quite small around the world. You know, 
know? And um, you get you got to meet and talk to people right there at the call. We spoke we spoke a couple of times with Gavin Anderson, who's the board developer, and so you were able to get really source information about what was going on. And um, so ever since then, I've just been um, working in what, uh, working basically to try and find ways to get adoption, get people to accept it, get people to use it in different ways, and also look at ways in which old currencies, cryptocurrencies, not just Bitcoin, but other currencies, can be used in society and within um, organisations. Um, particularly, one of the areas, my keen interest is in the way that uh, an organisation or a group of organisations could actually have their own internal currency within that organisation and operate with that and uh, only have to switch it across to out of Bitcoin into cash when you were dealing with the external, um, external group. So, yeah, it's sort of where I'm at. And, uh, yeah, we founded the association uh, a little over a year ago and we affiliated with the Bitcoin Foundation at the end of last year. Um, and, um, yeah, so that was a, that was a pretty, it was very, uh, that was a very, uh, just a little story about that, it was a very interesting period of time because when the Bitcoin Foundation first issued their proposed affiliate agreements, it looked like they'd been issued by corporate lawyers and everybody around the world was going, what is this? <laughs> but they were really good, they turned around and they listened to everybody and changed and altered and, and made it so that um, it became a lot more inclusive. And, um, and that was one of the reasons that well, Australia and Canada were the first ones to, to sign up and, um, and get involved in that respect. Hi, so my name is Chris Zosky. I'm from ABA Technology, which operates Bitcoin ATM. So we've got one in Sydney, Melbourne, and, and uh, in Canberra as of last Friday. So my <coughs> current business partner is my best mate's brother, and he still does work at IP Australia. He's a patent examiner. And uh, since about the start of last year, at every family event, he'd be talking Bitcoin. And everybody would just be telling him to shut up. But he was relentless, and every event it would come up. And he would talk and talk about it, go on and on about the benefits, how it's going to change the world, until his brother, who's my best mate, actually started listening to him and, and realised that he might be onto something. Um, and when that happened, my best mate told me, Chris, Maybe this is something that you should look into. Um, I decided to go over to the States, to Miami, for the big BTC Miami conference, to, to suss it out. And at that stage, my mate uh, was deciding to get into Bitcoin and start buying some as an investment. And he found it very, very difficult to purchase Bitcoin. So that was the first pain point. How do you get Bitcoin if you want to use it, if you want to hoard it for speculative reasons? Um, it was very difficult. Online exchanges were overseas, um, local classified type exchanges which were illiquid with huge spreads, and there was a lot of counterparty risk as part of that, as we can see with, with what happened to Mt. Gox. So we went over there with, uh, with the idea of looking for a business angle, and we identified Bitcoin ATMs as a natural um, need for the Bitcoin ecosystem and that that would be a uh, natural kind of path to mass adoption and uh, potentially a, a lucrative one where you could make a business out of it. So that's how we started and six months later, here we are with our third Bitcoin ATM, uh, second capital raising around behind us, a number, of, a number of more ATMs on the way and um, and very much enjoying and looking forward to, to the continuation of this journey because the space is very, very exciting. Thank you. Now, we've touched on a little bit about how Bitcoin can be game-changing. I'd love to, to bring it back to you, Chris, and, and just have you explain, I guess, your take on, on what is it about Bitcoin in particular that makes it game-changing? What is the qualities of it that really are? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm always asked this question actually, and I uh, always try to improve my answer each time. So let's see how I go. Um, well, it's not that it's it's not that it's a currency. Uh, that's the most confusing thing because that's actually fairly easy to understand. If one knows Australian dollars, um, we use them. We think we understand money. Um, I thought I understood money well enough, but the 
more I looked into Bitcoin, the more I realized that I really didn't understand it at all. Uh, but what also happened is that I, and we touched on this, I think, when we were chatting just before, um, I re realized what the core invention here really was. Uh, and it's, it's digital scarcity. So it's not a question of um, uh, trusting some new player into the market to, um, to, to, to do the same old thing as before, which is to, to ensure that when I decide and, and, and uh, sign off to transfer some wealth from me to someone else and in exchange for a sandwich or, or a Lamborghini or whatever, uh, that that happens. It's not just a matter of trusting some new person. It's a matter of uh, removing one party from that transaction. Uh, and uh, the way that that can happen, or has happened in history, is through using things like gold. Uh, and um, I also learned recently, this is the relevance of uh, gold here, that uh, economists... Oh, you mean in the Gold. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, out of the ground. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what uh, is used as a currency, or has been used as a currency in the past, but it's pretty bad as a currency, and there are reasons for it. But it's scarce and it's expensive to acquire. Uh, so that is one of the most important properties of a money. Um, but what it also enables you to do is, is create any other kinds of uh, financial instrument. Um, and you know, really, most of the things that we are going to be able to do with this technology haven't even been imagined yet. So the core invention, if I can sort of wrap it up here, although I know it's not very satisfying because it's so abstract, is in a digital world where we can have infinite, infinite reproduction uh, perfect duplicates made uh, forever. Uh, to digitally create something that is rare uh, is a, a new invention. Uh, it's actually also a solution to a long-standing and famous problem in computer science, which has people like me kind of excited. Um, but the reason why that's so good is because it removes uh, the need to trust the third parties in order to make a <coughs> transaction. Transaction can be money, and that's the case with Bitcoin in, in one sense, but when people say Bitcoin, sometimes they mean something more broad, like the, the underlying technology. Um, you know, they, mean, they may mean an actual price, so what is, how many Bitcoins do you have? Which is, it's like once you learn about it, it kind of, it's, not, it's even a funny way to think about it. Do you have Bitcoins, you put things in your pocket that are coins, is that really what it's like? Well, it's not really like that at all. Mm -hmm. So often we struggle to understand what it really is. Uh, and so, um, at the core of it, I'd say that's what it is, it's digital scarcity and, and, uh, and money is, is one of the things you can look at too. Mm. Um, I'll just take that a little bit further. Um, I mean, a lot of, like I said, a lot of people actually don't really know what money is and money needs to tick off a certain set of boxes to, to actually be money, or just really with this. So, in the first instance, scarcity is really important because it's going to be hard to come by. Um, and the next thing, it has to be portable. You know? uh, in the old days, you have to cut around a dozen camels to make a trade with carpets or women or something. And it's a lot easier to convert into something you can carry. It has to be durable. You can't cut it destroyed or ruined after a couple of transactions. Um, it has to be divisible. You have to give fractions or parts thereof. And it has to be uniform. You ought to know that that's the, that version of the money is the money that you're using. And the other aspect of it is that um, it needs wide acceptance. We all have to agree that it's worth that amount so we can actually use it. And at the end of the day, what money is, is really just a signal. It's a signal for human interaction. And um, the um, one thing that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency has an extra box ticked, and that's self-regulation. That is, it does in itself the job of government. It regulates itself, it regulates its, um, its rate, it regulates its inflation, it's um, a self-regulating system. And so it makes it much more robust than money as we know it. That's um, one aspect of it that I really like. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'd love to use that as a jumping off point to talk about, I guess, Self-regulation is one of the great things about Bitcoin, and that also, I guess, um, invites the, the anonymity side of things as well. That in a system that is self-regulating, individuals can transact anonymously without having to necessarily see the second party. I guess I'd love for you to share, I guess, your experience in terms of getting the Bitcoin ATMs, how you've managed to balance that timeline of um, providing that anonymity 
that Bitcoin offers, but also ensuring, I guess, financial security and stability. Sure. So I, I just want to bring up one more, oh, yeah. one of the benefits of Bitcoin, one of the true um, use cases, which is sending money or sending Bitcoin, which is the equivalent of money, anywhere around the world immediately, basically for free. So it's like emailing money. That is the functionality that is unlocked with the invention of Bitcoin. And that's pretty powerful because it means you solve a lot of um, of the financial inclusion problem, which is the fact that 60 70% of the world is not banked because banks charge high fees and there's a lot of regulatory costs involved with being a bank and therefore you have to pass those costs on to the consumer. Um, but the functionality of being able to send money without an intermediary or an institutional intermediary um, for free immediately anywhere around the world is very significant and it is the equivalent of what email did to post. Yes, we still have it, but the amount of more information exchange that goes on now because of the invention of email now is the messaging, etc. It has brought society forward by um, it, by causing such efficiencies and productivity gains, and this is going to continue on that path by allowing transactions to occur faster, cheaper. Etc. To bring up a couple of use cases, industry cases, at the moment, last year, there was $537 billion that was transferred around the world as international remittances. So that's Australians or, or Indonesian Australians sending money back home to Indonesia, Mexican Americans sending money back from America to Mexico, uh, Ukrainians in London sending money back to Ukraine. $537 billion. And the companies that facilitate that majority of them being independent international remitters, the biggest ones, Western Union, MoneyGram, they charge from 7 to 13% for that service. So if on average that's 10%, from 537 billion, the cost of that, the economic cost is $53 billion. Western Union earned $6 billion of revenue last year, of which 1.6 billion was profit. And this technology will make that service obsolete because now you can send that piece of value anywhere across the world without that intermediary and that alone shows the incredible importance of this technology and the underlying currency which is facilitating that currently has a market value of only eight billion dollars with a market value of eight billion dollars you cannot meet your practical potential of disrupting that $537 billion market. So the speculative investment or store of value case is if Bitcoin is to meet its practical potential, the value of Bitcoin has to go up because there is a finite supply of Bitcoin and that is hard coded into the protocol. <coughs> there are the benefits of it. There's anonymity as well which some people will call a benefit, some people will call a, um, a, a negative. Um, we have a international legal framework which is called Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Legislation. It's an international legislation where we as well, financial institutions have to identify their clients to control or try and mitigate the financing of terrorists and uh, the facilitation of money laundering. And there's been a lot of accusations that Bitcoin can help facilitate that. So where our business and a number of our industry participants, associates, are preemptively um, complying with anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing legislation to know our customers. So we are KYCing our customers for their own benefit, for the technology's benefit, so that it is legitimized, so that it moves from being a obscure, illegitimate technology that's, that is not mainstream into a legitimate one where everyone can have the comfort of, of using it because it is complying with international regulations and is not facilitating for um, illegal act activity. So just in our case, we identify one of our customers by them having to enter their phone number, 
uh, that we send them a text to make sure it's actually that phone number. Uh, they will scan their, um, their ID uh, and they will scan their palm so the next time they don't have to scan their ID, they can just come log in with their palm and, and they can use the uh, Bitcoin ATM and buy Bitcoins or sell Bitcoins immediately. All that data is stored in a secure database and will only be given to government authorities if we are issued with a warrant. But that means that we're compliant and the government will not come and, and create knee-jerk regulation which is going to kill this technology before it emerges and, and, and I guess starts giving all its, all, all its benefits to, to everyone. Lovely. Thank you. I guess going on from that, um, I'd love to explore I guess, some of the opportunities we see uh, it disrupting in terms of mainstream organisations and where we see some of the practical implications of Bitcoin in industries we, we already see. Would you love to? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think uh, I'm pretty sure there's probably a lot of questions as well, so I don't want yes. people to jump in and ask questions and stuff because uh, I'm sure there's loads of holes in what we've said. If you didn't know much about Bitcoin, you probably are still quite confused. But certainly, I want to say on that point, it took me many months of researching it to feel like I had my head around it at all. Uh, so that's kind of normal. But in terms of disruption to industry, um, the international remittance market is the most obvious um, big uh, target because um, not only do they extract that, uh, whatever it is, 50, 70 billion, I might stats uh, slightly off, but um, yeah, it's around that sort of figure. Uh, they extract most of that from the poorest nations in the world and the people who are trying to uh, send their money. I mean, in some cases, the, um, the fees are actually up to 40%. Uh, so they'll be disrupted for sure. I mean, everyone knows that, and it's actually lots of people working on doing that. Uh, I think a lot of the disruption will also occur within financial institutions in countries like Australia. Uh, some of the... Um, uh, well, take things like um, credit card fees. So the credit card fee, which is roughly 3% the um, merchant pays, and you think you're not paying for it, of course we all are, but uh, even when we pay cash, in fact when we pay in cash, the same price we're actually paying for credit card um, fees because the merchant has to pay them whenever anyone else uses them. Uh, that 3% uh, and 30 cents or whatever it is, uh, is mostly for a prevention, fraud uh, insurance, um, reparation, all of these different financial costs because uh, the, I think it's something like nine percent of credit card fraud, credit card transactions are fraudulent, uh, which is a cost that we all uh, have to pay when we use credit cards or whenever we use credit cards. Uh, none of that's actually most of the fraud prevention measures. The buildings full of people who are there working and paid to prevent that fraud from happening in the first place. All the chips and holograms and whatever the latest thing is on your credit card, all developed by people at great expense. <coughs> Um, all of the special auditors and people who are fraud experts who go and consult to those, there are whole business sectors and they're all um, basically going to be providing a service which has almost zero value uh, in the Bitcoin uh, model because most of that fraud can't actually happen in Bitcoin. Uh, there are categories, new categories of problems that can happen with Bitcoin. Uh, so I don't want to suggest that there's no problem there or that it's all ready to go. Uh, and we can go into that, but uh, that's an example, a uh, pretty concrete example, and I think you can just replicate that same story through all of these different kind of financial services, trading, uh, equities, um, a lot of this stuff is out of my sort of area of expertise, but, um, you know, maybe other people can go into more detail about where they see those sorts of things happening. Yeah, that, that was great, and 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 does it, I'd love to hear more about, I guess, the businesses you're working in, give me well, more the Bitcoin. Well, um, just following yeah. off of, on <coughs> in terms of disruptive technology, I think everybody can probably agree that it's got potential to be incredibly disruptive technology. It's five and a half years old, so let's get it in perspective. The last component of Bitcoin it will be issued in 2140. That's 126 years from now. 126 years ago, it was 1888. And a lot's happened since then. And a lot will happen between now and 2140. And even though in 2140 the last components of Bitcoin will be worth, will be issued something like 20 and 30 satoshis, um, the. Um, That's what I'm going to go into that. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, it's sort of like there's, will be a, the major components or major components of Bitcoin will sort of finally issue, I think around 2040, 
but the small micro transactions and the small micro, the bits and pieces to finish off all the blocks will be issued in 2140. So in 126 years, if it's $600 now, um, I have to think what the value is in that period of time if it continues to grow. So that's a bit of perspective. We're five and a half years into a 120 year project. So, um, I, mean, I think it has the potential really to alter um, every aspect of human contract, every aspect of our relationships. And um, just the last thing I wanted to say was that we're forming, we're, we're developing bigger and faster and more connected society, and we're talking and you know, having relationships with people all over the world all the time. And now we want to transact with people all over the world all the time. And our banking system is holding us back. It's stopping us from actually reaching our potential. Um, it's our my perception of it. And it, you know, they're essentially artifacts of the nation state, um, which are, you know, I mean, the last time <coughs> governments had this much control over currency was in the dying days of the Roman Empire. And um, so um, I think that that's a. a, a, a <laughs> <laughs> um, so the you're talking about the different things you can do with. I mean, as I said, one of the areas I'm interested in is, uh, is uh, other coins. There's about I don't know 175 old coins in existence today. They're being created all the time. Some work, some don't. It all depends. Uh, they're all uh, modelling off the same protocol. But um, what we're doing is we're finding different groups of people, different organisations, different um, <coughs> connected societies deciding to use this currency within themselves. And so, um, uh, I'm trying to give an example. Give an example. Dogecoin? Dogecoin. Doge <laughs> yeah, so Dogecoin is really interesting. It's, um, uh, it's actually up there in the top ten in terms of, you know, Coins. And it sort of was a joke, I suppose, at the beginning. But <clears throat> what they did was they marketed really well, <coughs> really good PR. You went onto the site where, where the source was, everything was there, and they really marketed it, and they're marketing it really heavily. Um, and, uh, you know, you might be talking, you know, for example, um, if you've got a, um, a one idea, you know, so one idea is, for example, uh, if you've got, say, uh, coffee shops. And you know, coffee shops now they they offer a loyalty card, things like that. Now, if you were to offer a Dogecoin or an altcoin as um, a payment or a reward for buying coffee, and you could tip the waiters with that, or you could um, build up and buy another coffee, and if you had a network of coffee shops that all were using that thing, that same thing, you could use that coin in all these other coffee shops, and so you've got this small currency thing going on within the network, within the group of businesses. And when they want to convert that into cash, you can convert Dogecoin into Bitcoin and then into, into cash if you want to do that. That's one example of a Do you have anyone to add to that? Yeah, no. So I think that's a couple of Well, yeah, let's open it up to questions. If you want a real, you want a real world example of that, the Iraqi dinar, exactly not so it's Swiss dinar in Iraq, exactly that. In terms of community and currency. Yeah, being, sorry, it was a community with its own currency separate from the actual government that was used within the southern part of Iraq, which was based on the whole currency support. Right, okay. Hi, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention a few of the examples that kind of really, when the light bulb started going off for me, um, so in terms of just applications for this. And, and one of them is like, because when you guys say, you know, it, it takes banks and middlemen of the picture. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to disrupt industries like Western Union and, and that. Um, but one of the things that this allows, it, there's a lot of situations that were never ever possible before. Um, micropayments being a big one. So, you know, iTunes is, you can buy a song now through iTunes. Uh, and just to think about, like, just newspapers and publishing, it's been too expensive for them to charge a subscription fee, you know, per article view or something like that. Um, so with this technology, it basically like opens the door for those kind of applications. So you can now, if I want to view an article 
it could be like, you know, essentially half a penny. And because there's no bank controlling that and it's just direct, all of those options become available. Um, and so the other big thing that I found was, you know, the example that I, I read was, imagine walking through a museum or just seeing graffiti on the street or something like that. Now because Bitcoin is separated from people, essentially, like you, you can just, I can create an account, you know, for my car if I want. I could create an account for, you know, an advertising poster or a piece of artwork that I created in a museum. And because it's separated from me, what that allows is that my painting in a museum, I can have a barcode sitting beside it. And anybody walking to that museum that wants to tip me some money because they like my artwork, they can pull out their smartphone, scan the barcode in, and they can send me five dollars, ten dollars. You know, things like that. So I, I heard about those kind of situations. Like, it's one thing to disrupt industries. Those kind of potentials have never been possible. You know, and the reason is because you've got a banking system where it's like, oh, you've got to pay 50 cents if it's over a dollar. You know, well, why would I do a transaction for a dollar if I'm going to pay 50 cents to the bank just to do that? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and then the, the last big one that I did, where I was just like, well, like, this is really quite scary actually, um, was the situation where, if you take the example I just gave with the museum, now correlate that, like, you know, disruptive technologies, Twitter, the internet, you know, look at what those, those technologies have done with the Arab Spring uprising. And what Bitcoin adds is, you know, taking the museum example, imagine those million man protests are now carrying, instead of little protest signs, they've got a QR code. They can now fund their revolution just by getting on the news and saying, here's our bank account, no one can freeze it. Like, that's never been possible before, and that's huge. And it happened too. Yeah, that's happened in a few, like, at football games and in the Ukraine uh, revolution, that was something that, that was one way that they got funding for their, you know, their guerrilla force. And it's like, you know, that, that's what this opens up. So that's why I think a lot of people are just really crazy about this. Because it's, when, they, when they connect those dots, it becomes, you know, very enlightening, really. So, anyways. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? Yep, in the middle of you. Probably just a first quick question about self regulation. I need to explain that, and I mean, I can myself, so um, I see a big potential here, but um, I want to bring it up to the uh, philosophical level, because we are all blind in the financial sort of narrow of the current uh, world system, so we don't see the other potentials. Every time we try to think about something that has benefits to the for example, the first people that bought bitcoins will be extra rich, but the nature doesn't allow that type of sort of, how to say, skewness because the others will be trying to do the same. So all this competition will actually. So, so the, the question about self regulation. So, 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 and so, so I'm just curious to see what's yeah. the big picture of this and how it's is going to bring benefits to the people, not just to take benefits for the people. Um, that's probably my favorite topic, so if I can just jump in. I've got the mic. <laughs> uh, the, um, if I can try and summarise the question too, just to make sure I've understood. Um, I, I, you, you mentioned the benefits to the many and not, not just to the few. You also mentioned that early adopters have, I guess, an unfair advantage, which I agree with. Uh, there's also the question of barrier to entry for other people to come along and make a competing or an alternate currency again. Did you touch on that? Are you interested in that as well? Oh, is that time there's a disadvantage, like an uh, unfair uh, game? Yeah, others will try to come the bells with their own game. Yes. But the, and the first thing I, I would like to know is how is self regulating? Because we need to understand right. first before trying to. Okay, yeah. so uh, just in practical terms, regulation usually um, means someone is entrusted with some power and they are um, subjected to uh, some kind of um, surveillance or they're watched. What they do is what is, is monitored uh, or what is it. And then that there are negative consequences for them not 
uh, for them abusing that power. That's what regulation normally comes down to. So the banks are regulated right now uh, with AML CTF legislation. Uh, they have to, and I assume uh, ABA has to also, uh, or is voluntarily, uh, submitting um, reports to um, Austrac and the various other uh, sort of administrators of this regulation uh, to uh, comply with the regulations. What it means is human beings then have access to this information about who's sending money where and what they're, what they're doing. Uh, and then they can uh, take a responsive action to say, ah, oh, that's a terrorist, or this, you know, now we believe that this uh, activity is suspicious or whatever. So human beings are making a choice about that. And in Australia, maybe we're not worried about who does that. Uh, maybe we feel that we're fairly safe because people in power have so many checks and balances against them. Uh, and I believe that too. I think Australia's a very safe place and that the people who have power um, have that counterbalance with other people who have power enough so that we don't suffer many of the sorts of things we see in the news happening everywhere else. But most of the rest of the world does suffer those things regularly. <coughs> So it's a much bigger deal outside of Australia that uh, you don't need to rely on regulators doing and other people who are entrusted, whether they're regulators or banks. I mean, for, let's just take uh, WikiLeaks. This isn't an example in Australia. Uh, WikiLeaks, whether you agree with what they do or not, in the US they have not uh, been charged with any crime. Uh, so they're not a criminal organisation by any current uh, thing that I'm aware of. Uh, yet uh, the credit card companies all together decided suddenly not to process transactions for Wikileaks. Uh, that's a form of regulation. Uh, it's conducted on behalf of people whose money are is being controlled by those companies, which is basically everyone's. Uh, and uh, they're saying, yes, that is your money uh, uh, that you, you have, and yes, we will allow you to transmit money to the Ku Klux Klan, uh, but uh, Ku Klux Klan, whatever they are. Um, but not to WikiLeaks. Why? Well, they don't even need to answer that question because they just, they're allowed to do that. They have, they're in that position. So uh, self-regulation, I think, is a term that I would probably um, uh, I would find ambiguous as well. But what I mean, what I think we mean by self-regulation in Bitcoin is that uh, the the system does not entrust as many parties, in fact, as few as possible, parties to transactions which means that there isn't anyone who can do something wrong, who actually could control your money and say that you can't give it to WikiLeaks or to terrorists. If you think WikiLeaks are terrorists, like some people do, then that's the same thing. But there really isn't any intermediary to say, no, you can't do that, or in some cases, and this is subject to the anonymity question, which we could go into, uh, you sent money to these bad people, so now we're going to charge you. So that's from the point of... Uh, avoiding subjective interference, like yeah. somebody... Yeah. Removing human judgment, that's the kind of self-regulation. The, 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 the other aspect is when the government the Reserve Bank decides to, to print money, oh, yeah. and then they inflate the currency, what that means, what's the advantage of the big operations is with everybody's value money, they, they take bigger share, so actually it's only they, they, they are the only beneficiaries. Yeah. How does Bitcoin address that problem? Well, so Bitcoin's got a very direct... So for example, now, not many people involved. Well, I think we're talking about um, monetary policy here. Does, does that sound good? Does anyone else... Um, you want to address that? Yeah. I, I think there's a framework that we have to remember. Self-regulation also could mean that all they did was give you a framework you have to choose to do wrong to actually do wrong. That's part of this self-regulation. It's saying here's a free and open platform to communicate not only financially, but communicate knowledge, communicate um, whatever you can think of. You can communicate using this protocol. We're saying if you want to be a terrorist, go and send money to them. That's why now I'm talking about the government decides to, to you know, play with interest rates. Mm. And, yeah, so we, the beauty Bitcoin. with Bitcoin is that there's very transparent rules. It's an open source protocol and anybody can have a look inside the, the, the rule book. And that's not the same with the current monetary system. Not many people know how it works. Fractional reserve banking is something that's very cryptic. Um, people don't really appreciate the fact that a bank has X percent capital on the balance sheet and can create eight times more than it's down. 
Um, and that's a bit of the core Bitcoin following is these liberal uh, liber libertarians who are anti the current capital system or fractional reserve banking system. Bitcoin as an alternative to that, and there is no credit function of Bitcoin yet, and that's why it's not a threat to the monetary system. Um, it's just a payments platform for the moment, but it's a transparent pla payments platform because there are miners, a little bit of a technical discussion, there are miners. These are computers or nodes all around the world that are competing against each other to solve cryptographic problems so they can have the honour of ordering the blockchain. Ordering the blockchain means that they perform the clearinghouse slash reconciliation function. At the moment, we rely on banks to do that and an RBA to do a clearing function between banks and they do that overnight. Uh, sometimes international transfers take three days, well that's how long they take. Um, the Bitcoin network takes 10 minutes. It is posted immediately and you can see that that transaction is awaiting confirmation but a reconciliation function happens every 10 minutes. The miners that are performing that and they're allocating a lot of resources to computer processing power to perform that functionality, they're rewarded with 25 bitcoins every 10 minutes. So there's an economic um, incentive for miners to compete against each other all around the world to perform this reconciliation function. Now, the difficulty of the cryptographic problem is updated every 14 days or so, so that it comes back to that 10 minute mark of uh, updating the, the, the blockchain, mining a block, and having a new master, master ledger, master blockchain, which is the ledger of who has what Bitcoin balance. That 25 Bitcoins which is issued, that's like newly minted currency. And that algorithm or formula of how many Bitcoins are issued is hard-coded into the Bitcoin protocol. And every X amount of time, the number of Bitcoins that are issued when every, mine, every block is mined, halves. So, so four years. every four years. So at the moment it's 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And in three years time, uh, I don't know what the next one is, in two years time, that is going to reduce to 12 and a half Bitcoins. Uh, and four years after that, that will reduce to 6.25 Bitcoins. And it's that issuance of Bitcoin being so transparent, which means we have faith in the fact that there's a limited number of Bitcoins, and nobody's going to fiddle with that, and we have faith in the scarcity of this digital property. It's a great question. That's why um, in these sort of short talks I never tried to go into how it works because um, how can you be sure no one fiddles with it? So the, um, how can you be sure no one fiddles with the way that it works? It's the same as the question of how do you um, know somebody is not going to try and rip someone else off and spend money twice uh, to uh, <coughs> counterfeiting, something like that. So all of those kinds of threats are in the same category. They all come down to the same thing and they're all protected by the same thing. Um, and that is just that rather than have one party like banks who's got a single record of what, what happens and who ultimately decides that, you have everybody doing it all at once. Competitively. Yeah, yeah competitively. And not only that, so, so, there, so therefore, imagine if everyone in the room had to get. <laughs>
in order to uh, double span and rip people off to change how the system works, you will definitely need a minimum to have a collusion of half of the resources that are currently securing Bitcoin. Uh, and it is far beyond even, say, the US military budget to achieve that end. So it is something that's not possible. It's also, if you had that, you'd be able to make a lot more money in mining. So you wouldn't waste your time breaking in. There's, there's, <laughs> lots, there's <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So you need to have 51% of the world processing power in the time at work to overwrite what was last written in the correct blockchain. So you would become the correct blockchain. So if you've got that much power, why would you waste your time? There's, a, there's a question down the back here. Yeah, this one waste your time. Um, but just on that, there's approximately, I don't know, about 250,000 computers currently running the program. So what you'd have to do is take control of 51% of those computers to actually rewrite the blockchain. Just segueing into that, there is a miner that last week uh, self-regulated down to 40%. Yes. Yeah. It was a pool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I understand yeah, it's a pool, but how, how, is the, how is the community going to deal with... I, I'd, love to, I'd love to talk to you about that. I, I am concerned that that will get us into quite technical territory. Um, and maybe what we could do is do a sub discussion later. Yes, yeah, I think that would be good. Idea. It's yeah. not, it's not, a, it's not an easy topic. And, and the, the the key there is that this technology has been around for five and a half years, and there's been those incentives, let's say, to break it for five and a half years, and it hasn't happened. So I think five and a half years is a pretty good testing period. Um, also, it has happened in all coins, so we know what happens when people do that as well. So that's something that the Bitcoin community can, can learn from. Practical situations where uh, other, other currencies have suffered that fate. I think we've got two last questions. What, one last question? Uh, yeah, so just a quick question. Um, the Bitcoin thing for me is... Um, I want to talk about the store of value aspect of it. Because um, it hurts my head when I get mm. paid in Bitcoin and tomorrow is actually worth more. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think all less. Okay. Less. okay. Especially so, less. I think in the so I'm a like I said, I'm a chartered accountant. So a lot of clients are asking me about um, should I get onto this? Should I be allowed to accept Bitcoin as payment? Um, and I'm not at all qualified to answer that question. But I also have the startups that I do. And I think maybe we should allow. To buy our songs with Bitcoin, or that will be a whole bunch of songs um, for each Bitcoin. Um, but the, the concept of a store of value is very important to me. So if I buy a Bitcoin today, I need to know that at least it will stay that value or increase. Well, I might want that, but it might not be a promise that can be made to me. And it cannot be made to me, then I have to price a premium for accepting that rather than, no, no, I'll just get cash into it. So the difference between Bitcoin and cash, the fact that we have cash still, will always be a fundamental you know, comparison. It's like being paid in BHP shares or something, and say, you know, call it BHP shares. Well, I think maybe not. You're, you're absolutely right about all that. Uh, and um, plenty of people do get paid in shares, uh, actually, at least partially. Uh, and so they make that same exact <coughs> trade-off. Uh, also, uh, when you say you, uh, when you're deciding between accepting Bitcoin and accepting just Australian dollars, uh, you're making a decision on the Bitcoin side about the future value of that Bitcoin in Australian dollars. Um, I think you also need to recognise that you're doing that for Australian dollars as well. Whenever you have an alternative, you're actually looking at a pair, the exchange rate between two things, so Australian dollar versus Bitcoin. When people talk about the true value of Bitcoins or how much does Bitcoin worth, of course they need in Australian dollars or maybe US dollars is pretty common too. And when you're in the US, of course, they need in US dollars. Uh, but, uh, and then when, when you're talking about Twitter shares, for example, you form an expectation of the future value of the company based on whatever, your expertise, your type of risk and all these different things. And you miss amount or more because it has the obvious potential to disrupt this remittance industry and it's going to need to have a value of something above this huge number in order for it to achieve that goal. Um, all of those things are reasons why that people use to estimate that future value. Uh, but the so what I think the future value is is not really important to you because you don't know the process I've used. But one thing I'm 
uh, I want everyone to know is that the future value of Bitcoin could be zero. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a possibility in my mind, and so I, I never advise people to invest in it. In fact, I think the actual investment aspect of Bitcoin is the least interesting thing uh, about it. But because of all the other interesting things about it, it does have that investment potential. Can I make a few points here? <clears throat> you talked about why would a merchant accept it. So um, the answer to that is because there are merchant service providers who are going to take that currency risk uh, away from the merchant and will remit them Australian dollars the following day and therefore they don't take that price risk. And that is a service which has been provided just like a, a credit card vendor who will pay the Australian dollars equivalent that, uh, at the point of the transaction. So there are those services out there and it's a commercial uh, service which is provided so that you can have the benefits of accepting Bitcoin such as lower transaction fees on the credit cards without taking that currency risk. Uh, this is a technology which is five and a half years old and it only started popping up on people's radar last year really. So it's really early days and the currency is still volatile but as in, there's only like three liquid <coughs> exchanges where it is traded but that is increasing every single day and as more and more people get involved in the space that volatility will go down and stabilise over time. And Nobody's expecting anybody to go and put anywhere near a majority of their money in Bitcoin. But if people put a hundred bucks into it to buy things online because it's safer than giving your credit card details on the net, you know, we're already talking huge volume just by people using a hundred bucks using Bitcoin. Um, and I think that's that's really good. It's giving me a good context for you know talking to my clients about you know, what you should be doing with Bitcoin. That's right, and every time it will, will, as the ecosystem matures, the price stabilizes, then that inherently makes it more stable for people to want to use it more and more. So it's a it's an evolutionary type technology and currency, if you like, and we're still at the early, early days. If you want an analogy, we're in the days of the if this is the internet, we are still at the stage where Companies didn't have websites, you know, at the evolution of the internet. That's where we are in Bitcoin today. Um, one of the things I wanted to also add in terms of future value, restored value, is that Bitcoin is a finite currency. There will be 21 million Bitcoins issued and then the inflation rate hits zero. And that's it. And so, um, for me, one of the things that's really exciting about it is that we're currently operating a financial system which is basically an open-ended equation of growth on a finite resource. And we know that's not working very well. And applying a finite currency to a finite resource makes, makes a lot more sense. But the fact that each time Bitcoin is issued, its inflation rate drops and it will reach zero and stop. Now that's something which is heads and shoulders above what the current system we've got. And the last time that happened was when, on, I mean, in all the years that countries were operating under the gold standard, prices in general dropped. They dropped for a hundred years until the, country, until the countries one by one abandoned the gold standard and just started printing money. And so, um, because we have this, we've got this impression that like money is this open end, there's always more. There's always more. Um, and so that drives a certain headspace I mean, in the way that you are looking at the future. Um, when, in fact, we've got a finite currency that could be used to, as a functional thing to operate society um, rather than just create wealth, you know. You're suggesting it would replace currencies? Um, my, uh, I my, my prediction is that um, um, cryptocurrencies will seize control of, on, of the online um, economy in due course within the next 10 years. Shift out across into online, um, take over the online economy. If you've got an economy that's got. I'm, the, I'm just going to have to catch you. We really have a lot of time for one last question and then we'll, we'll allow these conversations to we'll continue. We'll mingle. Yes, we'll mingle. Yes. Okay. My, mine's not technical or currency related, but it's more about the future. <coughs> so if you're going to disrupt the whole industries, the banking industry, the sending money overseas, whatever, what happens to 
the people that work in those industries? Like, has anyone considered where <laughs> all of those people will go? Yeah. I was trying to get them to come to these sorts of talks because <laughs> it's really valuable that we don't have a very sharp turn. Uh, and I think uh, that's why I promote um, technology literacy uh, and uh, science, technology, engineering, maths education, especially for girls. I think there's a lot of um, benefit to society for people controlling the direction of technology and being involved in it. Uh, and part of the thing that makes me see the future, if it's an accurate prediction, assuming that, um, I mean, I might have it all wrong, but um, if, if, if I'm right, it's my uh, experience with technology that's helping me out. And what it might well do is um, put more uh, resources, more, more wealth in the hands of the people who, who've got that skill set, and less in the hands of the people who don't. Uh, and I don't consider that to be a fair portion of of wealth, and I think a civilized society does have a fair um, you know, distribution of wealth. So, in order to have civilization, we need to have technical education.